All right, welcome to chapter 16. We're going to take a look at this real quick just to kind of make sure that you are uh, getting the uh, the information that you need as you read through this chapter. Uh, the objective sort of trying to help you out here. You're going to talk about Mughal society to about 1750, talk about Ottoman society for that 250 years between 1500 and 1750, talk about the Safavids from uh, 17 or to around 1750 or so. Uh, if you took this class a long time ago, you uh, would talk about the beginnings of the Ottoman Empire, the this kind of period of time and here as the, the rise of the, gun, the so-called gunpowder empires. Now that, of course, term has gone out of favor. But we uh, do still talk about the uh, these acts being a very important part of uh, the development of, uh, well, in the case of the Ottoman Empire of Europe, and, uh, of course, the Safavids in India, or, uh, the Safavids in the Middle East, and then India. So uh, we're kind of taking that part of the Islamic world and kind of forcing yourself into uh, uh, India as well by the time you get through this chapter. Uh, the book begins talking about the, uh, the founding of the Ottoman Empire. By uh, the 1300s, the Ottomans will control uh, most of what had been the old Byzantine Empire especially trying to gain control of Constantinople, which they will do by 1453. The uh, Ottomans will, uh, needing soldiers, will uh, capture and enslave, especially very young uh, children from the areas they were conquering, uh, convert them to Islam, uh, and then uh, give them a very privileged place in uh, the uh, the army, they were called the, the Anishiri, or when that sort of gets translated out, they're called the Janissaries. And uh, they are uh, a very big part of the Ottoman army. The, uh, a lot of times, people on the very low end of the economic spectrum would uh, turn over their children to the Ottomans because their life, even as a uh, almost an enslaved, uh, uh, unfree uh, uh, Ottoman soldier was better than the life of a peasant in uh, some of those areas. The uh, Ottomans are going to conquer Constantinople in 1453, which technically destroys the Byzantine Empire. And some people would argue uh, really ends the last phase of the Roman Empire, you could make an argument that the Roman Empire lasts uh, through the Byzantine world all the way to 1453. Constantinople then becomes a, uh, a major capital. It's renamed into Istanbul. And uh, today, of course, it is, it's still Istanbul and uh, still sort of bears the uh, resemblance of two worlds, the Byzantine world and the Islamic world. From there, the Ottomans go on to conquer a great deal of uh, not only the area in the Middle East, but also they'll begin to push north and uh, west into southeastern parts of Europe, into Greece, into uh, uh, areas around Hungary, and all the way up eventually close to Vienna and Austria. The other places they're moving into the Middle East, they'll go all the way out to uh, Baghdad and modern-day Iraq, but also control uh, some of the important cities in uh, the Islamic world, including Mecca and Medina and Jerusalem, which not only gave them a, a big uh, area to govern, but it also gave them a, an important tax base that was made uh, really wealthy, some of these areas, by trade. So uh, during the reading, you'll read about Suleiman, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. Okay, so make sure you understand what Suleiman does, how, uh, why he's called the Magnificent. Uh, the Ottomans also uh, are uh, part of uh, the uh, the Islamic world, but also brought with them some of their own institutions. And so uh, you uh, should understand what the harem is and its purpose. Okay and uh, how uh, really the, the Ottomans governed this area. 
uh, what they were good at, architecture, the uh, textiles, rugs, uh, things that were trading goods, they were uh, very good at. So uh, this area is a trading area, and uh, they kind of sit right in that crossroads of uh, trade. From here, you move a little bit further to the east and talk about the Safavids, which develop in what is today modern-day uh, uh, Iran. The uh, Safavids are always associated with Shiite Islam. Uh, there's a difference between uh, Sunni Islam and Shiite Islam, so make sure you know the difference between those two. And the Safavids are really part of uh, the Shiite world. Uh, they do not necessarily get along with the Ottomans. They don't really get along with some of these areas. They will try to expand into some of these areas. Okay. And again, they sit on a major trading route as well. So uh, one of the things you want them to you want to see them, uh, or they wanted to see happen, was an increase in trade. And they had some important trade goods as well, including... Uh, things like textiles, but also uh, wonderful uh, uh, mosaics, tiles that they uh, traded as well. From there, okay, you uh, move on to talk a little bit about the Mughals. The Mughal Empire develops in India in uh, the 1500s. So uh, know that Babur is a descendant of... Uh, Tamerlan and Genghis Khan, so technically they are uh, descendants. The Mughals are descendants from uh, the uh, from the Great Khans. Uh, the Mughals will uh, be Muslim. They will uh, be a part of the Islamic world, but they're ruling over a part of the world that is very Hindu. The most dominant religion in India was Hindu, and that's a big time challenge to govern as a minority and especially as a religious minority. So one of the tact or one of the tactics that the uh, that the Mughals adopted early on was to try to rule with some tolerance. And uh, Babur and some of his successors were pretty good at that. Later, as the Mughal Empire begins to collapse, that tolerance will disappear. And it's one of the reasons why the Mughal Empire collapses later on because uh, the Hindus began to be discriminated against. Okay. The uh, probably the most famous ruler, uh, the most famous Mughal ruler during this period was Akbar, who uh, really will uh, truly develop the Mughal world into uh, a great empire. Died in 1605. His uh, Jahangir takes over, Jahan, the wife, is very good and sort of keeps the empire together. The uh, You get, though, to uh, the kind of end under especially the rule of Aurangzeb, and Aurangzeb uh, is uh, the worst. He is going to undo a lot of that religious toleration and, as a result, really kind of hasten the end of uh, the Mughal world. When uh, that begins to happen, by the way, as the Mughals begin to sort of uh, uh, go by the wayside, it's important to realize who picks up the pieces, and it's the British. The British, along with other Europeans, are starting to move out into these areas, and uh, they want to have influence, especially after uh, this wave of first of exploration, and now as you start to move into kind of that phase of conquest, the British are going to uh, especially move into areas, start moving into India, for example, making uh, uh, trade contacts in uh, India. The Portuguese, the Dutch, the French are all trying to get out into uh, South Asia as well, the various parts of it. So later, when we talk about imperialism in a couple of chapters, we sort of go back to this, and we talk about how the Europeans are beginning to push their way out into these areas. Uh, the British will establish trading outposts throughout India. The East India Company, the British East India Company, becomes uh, a huge conglomeration of uh, companies associated with trade in India. They have uh, bases, they're called forts sometimes. They have forts in places like Bombay, and Calcutta, 
And uh, as the Mughals begin to start to fall apart and lose influence, the British are going to be there to kind of, especially the British East India Company, is going to be there to kind of sweep in. The British government really doesn't even have to get involved with this yet because uh, the British East India Company would uh, hire soldiers, would hire people uh, to work for them. So they have really their own military force. They have uh, the ability to govern a lot of these regions. And so as the Mughals begin to fall apart, the British will pick up the pieces and it makes them eventually, uh, by about eh, you know less than 100 years later, it makes them really masters over India. So uh, just make sure that as you sort of get through uh, the rest of this chapter that, you know, there are three major things that we are trying to kind of cover in this class, all right, that you're, or in this, excuse me, in this chapter that we're trying to talk about the Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughals, and like I said, if you're taking this class a long time ago, this was the gunpowder empires, but they all kind of have their place, okay? And next, of course, we will start to uh, see, uh, all right, another part of the world as well. This map sort of gives you a good idea about what we were talking about. The Ottoman Empire, if you guys notice, will expand uh, out into, uh, towards, not only towards Syria and those areas out there, but it also expands uh, north and uh, westward into uh, places close to Austria even by uh, 1683. The, uh, I was telling you about some of the, the art Okay, so you can uh, see some of the art from Tokapi, uh, the recruitment of uh, the uh, uh, children for Janissaries. Okay, so all this stuff is in uh, your, uh, and of course this is, by the way, this is Hagia Sophia. And uh, it used, uh, during the, the Byzantine times, Hagia Sophia was uh, a wonderful cathedral, a wonderful Romanesque cathedral. Now, since it is part of the Islamic world, you notice the minarets that are around it, which is a sign of uh, Islamic architecture. And uh, this is technically a mosque now. The, uh, uh, here's kind of a, another view of it. All right. So uh, the Safavid Empire, which I mentioned earlier, you can see is out there in between uh, the, the Ottoman Empire and uh, the Mughals, and it's that area where today really is modern day Iran is. So here's some of the tile work I was telling you about. Okay, and then finally the Mughals, which we talked about. Okay, all right, we'll stop there. Don't forget that you need to be making sure that you're doing your homework. That homework is important, it not only counts for your attendance, but it's important for your grade as well. So make sure that you're turning that in on time and we'll be back with chapter 17.